Hello. 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 Yeah, Hello. so we have a little warm up before we start. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll we just, we're just getting started. So <laughs> we just wait for Vikram to come in. Hang on. I'm just going to uh, get to. Hello to the audience who just joined us, everyone. We're going to be starting very, very soon. Hang tight. And we have our special guest, uh, uh, Dr. Professor Munira Alatas, who's here. And we are so, so grateful and privileged to have her on board. And yeah, I'll leave the rest to everybody else. I will be switching off my video because I'll be, I'm actually hosting the stream. So. <laughs> Munira, I love your background. <laughs> oh, it's it's my it book so motivational. <laughs> it's my study, my very small study. trying to see whether I can see what books are behind there. <laughs> Do you know, are you okay. still on the list? <laughs> Everyone in Facebook Live, we are now live. Uh, we, we are now, you, you should be able to see us right now. So welcome and uh, welcome to the Troublemakers Assembly show. <laughs> okay, Jinchi, um, I'm, it's all uh, your session now. Great. Thank you, Charles. Right. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Jinchi, and together with my team, Charles, Vikram, and Vinod, we welcome you to Troublemakers Assembly 2021. Organized by the Design School at Taylor's University, Troublemakers is in its third year now, and 2021 is our second year conducting our conferences online. Troublemakers Assembly is a gathering to honor and learn from the inspirational work done by an array of engaging personalities who have, in their own unique ways, made a mark in society through creative problem solving. This year, we have prepared for you another list of exciting troublemaking e-conferences. This series aims at creating audience immersion through an active and meaningful content with the end objective of inspiring the audience to become their very own change makers. To all Taylor staff, make sure you have registered for this session in HR at Taylor's. Attendance will also be taken here. Watch out for the link that we will be sending later to record your attendance. For other university staff and students whose institutions require proof of attendance, you may write to us. This, there is a survey that we have prepared for you as well. So um, we'll send you the link later on. Um, just watch out at the live feed, yeah? Now, don't forget to like and share our Facebook page, um, as well as to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Okay, let me now formally introduce our speaker for August 2021, Dr. S. Munira al -Adas. Dr. Munira has a doctorate from, sorry, Dr. Munira has a doctorate from Columbia University, is an academic at the National University of Malaysia, specializing in geopolitics. She is also a columnist and a life member of the Academic Movement of Malaysia and the Association of Global South Studies. The title of Dr. Munira's presentation this evening is Higher Education in Malaysia, Global University Ranking, the need to decolonize and depoliticize. Before I pass the session over to the speaker, I encourage everyone to post at least one question for Dr. Munira in our live feed during or towards the end of her presentation, as we would love to hear from each of you. Thank you. Let us now welcome Dr. Munira. Thank you very much for um, that introduction, uh, Jinchi, and Thank you so much for um, um, giving me this opportunity to talk to uh, many of Taylor's university students and faculty. Um, I'm, I was very impressed and actually, um, um, yeah, I laughed at, at when I got the email from G, uh, Jinchi 
um, because it said troublemakers assembly. And it was so apt because that's what academics actually do. Um, we are troublemakers to leadership. That's how they, they see academics around the world that we basically uh, challenge existing norms. Um, so let me get right into it. My presentation is actually going to be focusing a lot on um, ideas that have we have inherited from the past and how it has penetrated into our higher education culture, okay? Um, this has a lot to do with um, politics, how politics uh, in Malaysia has influenced um, how our universities are run as well as the so-called academic culture that exists in our universities. Um, now, the, the three main themes are about, that I will speak about, uh, how knowledge is produced in, in universities in Malaysia, um, what knowledge is prioritized, and the third theme is how leadership or um, political power determines what we learn. And all this is within the context of um, Malaysia, okay? Now, when I say um, past um, in the present, okay, I'm referring to how history, our history, dating back to before 1957, how that history has shaped our policy today. And this policy is not only confined to um, our politics, but it has infiltrated aspects of our um, culture, as well as how we educate our society, okay? Now, some aspects of this past in our present refers to the psychology of manipulation by leadership. Now, if we go back to colonial Malaya, um, we can identify this psychology of manipulation by British colonial rulers. Um, there were reasons for this, specifically to further colonial capitalist activities of the British colonists. Um, now these capitalist, colonial capitalist uh, activities resulted in this phenomenon we call the captive mind. And we see this today. And along with this captive mind, we have a, a widespread um, phenomenon of false consciousness among the leadership as well as the general society. Now, let me explain. Um, colonial capitalism is when, as it relates to the British in Malaya, these foreigners controlled and had access to capital. Trade and industry, agricultural extraction, these were dominated by foreigners, by the British who came to colonize the region. Colonial powers favored agricultural production in the colonies. Um, as a result, um, because of their need to extract the raw materials, um, to fuel their own development endeavors back in their home country. They suppress the natives, meaning the uh, indigenous Malay population or Malayan population, so that they would not become an obstacle to these capitalist activities. The natives were subdued for the sake of advancing British economic interests in order to keep them in check, okay? These, um, the British would depict the natives, okay? Now, now, for lack of a better word, I'm referring to the, in our indigenous uh, regional population as natives, but I'm referring to the original people who inhabited our part of the world, Peninsula Malaya, uh, who are the Malays and the Bumiputra. Um, these uh, were 
they, they were depicted by the British as unintelligent, lazy, indolent, um, unfit to rule and even evil, okay? These um, descriptions of, of us in this part of the world were written by Western academics, uh, British academics. So they were not um, popular bloggers, all right? They were actual, actually engrossed in analytical research. They were employed by the British East India Company, many of them were asked to write and research and study the colonies that they were in charge of. Um, so for all intents and purposes, these were serious publications. Um, but in the process, the strategy was to dehumanize who they were in control over. So this strategy to dehumanize um, was a strategy to break the spirit and to lower the self-esteem of those that the, uh, the British wanted to control and have control over. And the whole process was to maximize their capitalist activities. Um, now, I mentioned earlier about the captive mind. Uh, this, this term, this concept of captive mind originated by, was originated by um, our own Malaysian sociologist, Said Hussein Alatas. Uh, he wrote this in an article that was published in um, 1967. Um, now, the definition of a captive mind, it, uh, basically, he listed several uh, definitions, of which I will list a few here. Um, Specifically, a captive mind is an uncritical and imitative mind. A captive mind does not have an independent perspective on several issues and does not engage in original problem selection. Okay, uh, now I will evaluate and um, uh, expand on this later. But the key uh, issue about or the key drawback of a captive mind is uncritical borrowing of concepts, analysis, overgeneralizing, um, description and interpretation from Western scholarship. So there is a tendency to look up or look outside of our own contributing factors or our own culturally uh, relevant or specific factors. We tend to look up and look outward to a Western scholarship. Now, this is in the context of higher education, but throughout society in terms of how the media represents uh, politics, for instance, um, often we, we lift terminology from the West or we lift metaphors from the West. Um, we, we can discuss this more later, but that's essentially the, the uh, fundamentals of a captive mind. Now, some of the examples, um, I think I've already mentioned it, we, we latch a high prestige uh, or attach a high prestige to publishing in American and British journals, for instance, we think these are the journals with the best quality, American and British. Uh, we place a high premium on Western university education. This is not to say that um, we should reject Western university education. After all, I myself am a product of that. But we should not go all out of our way to put down um, somebody whose degree is, let's say, from an, a university from Argentina or from an Indonesian university, or we should not praise somebody or be confused. My gosh, did so-and-so politician or MP has a degree from Harvard and yet she is uttering such nonsense. So you see, somebody from Western or Harvard University um, need not be a smart person. I mean, we have to look at the entire 
um, problem in totality and not just focus on the Harvard factor. All right, and now let me uh, proceed and maybe in the Q&A we can discuss this a lot more because I see discussions like this on social media a lot. Um, how could so-and-so be so stupid uh, because they've got an Oxford degree? Or please hire that person because they have a Yale degree. Um, so we need to focus on this question a lot more. Um, now, the last point about a captive mind is that we seem to accept that most non-Western knowledge is subordinate. Um, generally articles written by scholars from African countries, for instance, that focus on uh, West centrism or uh, oppression or, or hegemony of Western powers. We tend to dismiss African writers, for instance. Um, however, an African sitting in an, uh, or rather an, um, a Nigerian who has faced his own past of colonizing, of colonization is similar to our experience. Yet we, we seem not to uh, refer to that commonality. Uh, we dismiss them as inferior knowledge. And to me, this is a very prevalent attitude among um, us academics in Malaysia. And this, this is not right um, because of the prevalence of this captive mind. Now, along with the captive mind, we have this another phenomenon of um, false consciousness. People's inability to recognize inequality or oppression and exploitation in our society. The thinking is that all is normal uh, and legitimate when it really isn't. And believing that you vote, for instance, you vote for a better future, but in reality, we don't realize that our vote benefits only a select few who turns out to be the thieves in our um, system. So there is a wide um, tendency for us to be constantly in, clouded in this false consciousness of being. Uh, by the way, this concept is taken from uh, critical theory. Okay, uh, Some of you who are in that field might be aware of, of this term. Um, now, what about false consciousness in Malaysian society? Um, it is kept alive by leadership um, because leadership has the tendency to keep the masses um, in a misperceived reality. Politicians, for instance, tend to ethnicize or racialize society's problems. Um, the tendency is to cover up the real issue which is actually socioeconomic inequity and class structures. But we are used to hearing ethnic and racial um, overtones in this. Um, as, especially, for example, when we talk about the, any discourse on the NEP uh, and poverty, it's always constructed around uh, race. Uh, it's constructed around Malay rights, Katwanan Malayu, and the idea of um, the poor Malay B40. Um, but in fact, poverty must be considered a class issue, a problem that affects humanity uh, and all races in our society and not just one particular race. But of course, this uh, issue of the NEP, uh, you know, it, it warrants further uh, further lectures and a series of lectures, um, not just um, here today, tonight. But um, this is the idea of the false consciousness that I'm trying to highlight. Um, now the politics that has infiltrated higher education, 
let's combine the coloniality, the captive mind, the false consciousness. These three phenomena are observed in higher education in the form of, um, I, I would list a, a few. Um, first of all, in the form of our university course modules. Um, then we have it in the form of our mode of instruction. For instance, the way we interact with our students. Okay, um, we can talk about this in detail soon. The third way is our three, uh, the researchers, our, um, our lecturers, their theoretical approaches in social science disciplines. We tend to uh, be very narrow. We don't question the established norms and theories. Now I'm speaking as a social scientist, okay? So my examples are predominantly from the social sciences, specifically um, uh, political science, sociology, um, history as well, and IR, uh, which I don't separate it because to me, IR falls within political science. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the narrow approach to how we teach about theory um, is, is that we don't question the established norms. And most of these norms are established by so-called the superior knowledge producers in the West. Um, again, also it's our quality of assessment of course modules. Uh, and this brings up the discussion of our MQA criteria, um, the, as well as criteria for academic um, promotions. And of course, last but not least, a very, um, the bane of our existence, which is our worship of global university rankings data. Um, this is a serious issue, uh, but we don't seem to be able to shake it. Uh, although some of the universities in the West, in the developed West, uh, are beginning to see and are beginning to reject um, a lot of the practices that are around, that surround the ranking system. Um, now, a, a note about coloniality, all right? Um, Coloniality is a term, it's a sum of all the activities of the colonizers that I referred to much earlier, uh, connected with economic activity. Aimed at, um, it's aimed at creating an image of the natives or the colonized so that they think of themselves as intellectually and morally inferior to the Europeans. Um, as a result, the colonized, they start denigrating themselves. They neglect their own culture and they think of the foreigners as superior. Um, in a similar way, uh, we grade, we grade our universities based on universal standards set by this ranking system. So my question, uh, one of few that I'm going to throw out to you is, is this accurate? And should we continue doing this? Uh, because what does that say about us? Uh, are we denigrating ourselves? Are we neglecting our own culture? Now, let me put a caveat here. I am not rejecting the standards set by many universities who are part of the ranking system, all right? I'm not rejecting it wholesale, but I am rejecting many aspects that don't agree with the level of our higher education progress in our part of the world so far, the criteria used, okay? Uh, let me proceed with um, another development based on historical ideas, but contextualized currently, is this notion of um, coloniality without colonialism, today's Malaysia. Um, we have an elite mindset behavior, okay? This elite mindset. Now, what do I mean by that? 
uh, our leaders are, most of us are Western trained. We revere Western education. We consider Western education sophisticated. You can see this on the media uh, in WhatsApp group discussions. Um, when somebody's daughter or son is sent to the UK, um, if that person is well placed uh, in society, they talk about this fantastic apartment they are going to rent or buy in a very exclusive London um, town uh, or segment of London. Um, you can see that there's this love of the British high life or the high society of Britain. And it's not even the US, all right? It's, it's still the connection with our British colonial past. Um, there's also this idea of um, feudal culture. Uh, and what I mean by feudal, I don't mean to uh, denigrate the fact that we do have a royal um, community here. That's not what I mean. And for more information about feudal culture, I would uh, suggest you also read uh, Shaharuddin Ma'ruf's um, very good, well-written book on um, feudalism in our history, okay? Uh, now, I mean the masses are subservient to VIPs. We are subservient to somebody with titles. We are subservient to um, um, VIPs in such a way that we overlook or we refrain from commenting if somebody who is a VIP breaks the rules. We may do it very actively on social media because many are keyboard warriors, but face to face, uh, I doubt people are, um, I have seen it with my own eyes. They'd rather keep quiet and <laughs> um, complain about it behind their back than face to face because it's not done. The feudal uh, culture there is that we don't, you don't talk to somebody and be direct. In some instances, yes, it's okay to reserve your anger um, or rather your displeasure and put it politely. But in other instances, uh, we must be able to distinguish between what needs an immediate solution and what needs to be dealt with uh, in due course. And this is where I find the problem exists in our society. We put off things that shouldn't be put off in the name of we need to be respectful or polite. So we need to consider this kind of uh, behavior when it comes to our social and political crisis. Um, another aspect of, of this culture is uh, found in our political publications uh, and the control of the media. Um, now the book, uh, Revolusi Mental, as we know, published in 1971, um, uh, that is an example of coloniality. The authors were, uh, at that time, were members of, um, of the ruling party. They, um, the book presents a very unflattering image of the Malays, okay? There, there are paragraphs which describe the Malays as um, dishonest, lack of courage uh, to fight for the truth, always fail to resist being exploited or oppressed, um, possess a fatalistic attitude, do not think rationally, uninterested in science and technology. I think I've heard this many times from our fourth prime minister and um, a few others. Um, do not persevere, not frugal, undisciplined, unoriginal, un unimaginative, generally backward, okay? Now, this book, Revolution Mental, as well as Malay Dilemma, is full of these descriptions of, of what the Malays are, and therefore, we've written this book to encourage you to come out and progress. That's the attitude. Um, so the book's intention is to offer advice on how 
Malays can progress. Um, obviously, and it was published after May 1969, um, but decades later, the same narrative is being used, um, mainly by political leaders. And of course, it becomes mainstream discussion or narratives um, among the public. Uh, political and religious leaders use the same narratives uh, under the notion of encouraging the Malays to succeed. But this is not, um, what has this res resulted in? This narrative of coloniality set by the current leaders um, is actually similar to what was used by the British. Uh, it has resulted in a culture of submission to authority, and of course, low self-esteem. It has resulted in the disadvantaged always turning to leadership for solutions. So what has developed? It's a mentality of dependency. It is uh, indirectly encouraged by this constant narrative to um, suppress your self-esteem. Um, now, how has this impact uh, has it had an impact on higher education? Um, we have a knowledge culture, um, basically, that fulf fulfills a specific political and economic agenda. Um, and to me, this is a form of intellectual oppression through de um, dependency. It's a lack of academic freedom in that sense, a neglect of academic culture, not to say that we actually have a, an ap academic culture uh, as what we read about, um, um, for instance, in the movie, Dead Poet Society. Now that is true academic culture. I don't know if many of you have seen the movie, um, but we have a, a, a profound neglect of academic culture. And then, of course, we surrender to global university ranking exercises. Um, driven, we are also driven by ideas which assume that education standards set by the political elite uh, is uh, more prestigious and necessary for development. Uh, the penchant to question policies is not there. Um, Again, it also has contributed to our, our lack of critical thinking, a preference for descriptive research, fear of challenging existing theories, lack of original ideas. Um, researchers are also unable to understand problems um, and link them to appropriate action. We do not make the connections among various phenomena. So what I'm actually referring to is we, many academics in our higher education institutions, and my experience is of course with the public university system, is that we have poor analytical uh, or critical thinking skills, but we do pay lip service to these words. Um, but it's very, um, depressing that I don't think many I interact with actually understand what it means to analyze or be critical. Um, another very sad development is a decline in um, classroom discourse. There is a preference for top-down linear passive learning and educating. Um, we of course are familiar that this happens in the primary and secondary school system but at the university level, it is also happening. It's, um, it, it's criminal in my opinion. Um, I think I'm going to stop here. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank you for listening and I'm sure you have questions. So please ask and uh, I will attempt to, to answer. And if I, um, I would like it to be as interactive as, as possible. So back to you, um, uh, Vinod or, or Jinchi, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, Dr. Munira. Um, okay, so I mean, while we wait for the questions to come in, let me start off by asking you this. We, why are we unable to overcome this colonial construct uh, to be held captive men, men, you know, mentally uh, and to continue to seek validation for these Western, uh, from these Western institutions and companies? Why after 60 plus years of independence, aren't we able to overcome this? Okay, I, I may not have um, a one size fits all answer, but you know, I'll attempt to suggest that leadership benefits from this system uh, of maintaining a captive My. population. Okay, leadership um, may be aware of it, but at the same time, because higher education is so politicized, you need to keep a certain captivity of minds so that there is no challenge coming from academia. I mean, after all, in history, if you look at many different countries all over the world throughout the 19th or 20th century, um, revolutionary change started on campus, on university campuses. Now, we're all aware that, you know, we, we are, um, universities are, are microcosms of great minds that are also <laughs> forever questioning what is normal, you know, questioning the norms of society and aware that when norms don't agree with uh, certain trends, we need to get rid of them and change things. Uh, leadership in our country today understands that. Um, so I think there is a lack of sincerity when it comes to really developing our universities to think critically. There, there is a deliberate attempt not to do that. And, and this is the depressing system or situation that we find ourselves in for decades. Um, I, I'm hoping the next generation is going to realize this and really try to change it, but it will have to come from leadership. I, I doubt um, it is a bottom up change. You know, of course the ideal situation is that it, the change has to come from both sides. Um, but in our situation, we need um, <clears throat> change from top down um, because civil society actually is aware of the problem. It's just that we haven't been able to penetrate the ceiling that has been set by uh, political leadership. Do you, do you think that, um by having maybe may, of course if it's not being done at um at higher educational level um it's probably also not being done at primary and secondary school level as well um because i think the history subject has has a lot to do with the framing of this or rather the explaining and uh and, and unraveling of this 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 captive mind thing so if 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 is it possible maybe if colonial history is thought with a lot more rigor at at primary level and secondary level this this possibility to dispel uh to for people for people to begin looking uh at, at this imposition of values or or standards from wherever they may come from would be a lot, the people would be a lot more discerning uh, when, when, it, when this happens. Uh, so perhaps one of the possibilities could, could be uh, the introduction of colonial history, uh, you know, uh, in history books as opposed to what it is right now, but of course. Well, you know, uh, uh, when it comes to how history is taught in the school system, uh, it's very myopic. Uh, I mean, we are, we have become a very polarized society, mainly because we haven't exposed our kids to inter-civilizational history. Um, you know, we, we don't teach art history uh, 
um, of the Greeks, for instance, because there are too many naked bodies, um, you, you know, for the wrong reasons. Uh, but that aside, um, too many churches, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but at the same, at the same time, why we need to know what the West has gone through, what the West has struggled with, how the West overcame problems, and the similarities between the events that the West went through, vis-a-vis -vis politics and religion, uh, and what we are grappling with. So, you know, there are so many commonalities and differences um, that we can learn through um, exposure to other cultures. Mm. But, yes, Jinji. Um, yeah, Vido, we have some questions from the floor. Okay. Uh, yeah. Apologies. <laughs> no, it's just... okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, we, we have um... a. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, there's a few here. Mm. All right, um, so let me ask the first one. I think the first one is a hypothetical, uh, and so it comes from Joan Lim. Um, so she says, uh, if you were Minister of Education, what would be your focus to remedy? Now, she refers to this situation. I'm not sure what this situation refers to, but perhaps the, the colonial uh, you know, the, the, the colonial mentality thing as well as the politi politicization. So if you were education minister, what would you do to address or remedy this situation? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> first of all, I think we need to, as far as the universities go, we've got to separate politics from university administration. Um, you know, we have vice chancellors or the board of universities are political appointees. So um, I think this is the first step. Uh, it's not easy to do, I'm sure, but it has, somebody has to do it, somebody has to start. Um, and not just one university, but maybe 20 uh, all at once. So basically university administration has to be free of politics. Um, the, other, the other problem that exists in universities is I, I would probably instruct, let's say I am um, aware of a board of governors of a certain university who are not performing. Uh, I would talk down to them and tell them to get to know your staff, get to know your professors, your associate professors, your lecturers, your junior staff. Um, not everyone is a researcher in the same way. Not everyone teaches in the same way. Not everyone responds to the bureaucratic rules and regulations to get promoted in the same way. So to me, there are micro changes that need to be addressed. You know, it's not just the Minister of Education has to change the hierarchy. It, it's not just that, it's the whole interaction. It, after all, what is a university? It's made up of people. People who are highly educated, highly creative, who have opinions, who communicate with each other and want their voice to be heard. I mean, these are what academics are, right? We don't just write and, well, I hope we don't just write and keep quiet. I mean, many of us, want our ideas to be accepted uh, and also hopefully to change the problems that exist. So I don't know if I'm answer answering your question, Joan, but the, the problem is very much more micro and intricate mm. uh, because it's, it's a problem of human, humanity. It's a human problem of knowing who your academics are and um, tapping on that talent. Uh, so, but God forbid, I, I don't want the position. <laughs> Thank you anyway. So it's always the people who don't want it, who needs to have it, right? Uh, you know, it's usually the case. And plus now with the uh, higher education minister stepping down, maybe you're a shoe in. Let's move on. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> um, okay, question two is from Malene Kang. Um, 
the same person who took advantage of that stopped that. I don't I don't understand this question. <laughs> I think I'm gonna skip this one. Yeah, mm. the structure. Um, yeah, we have actually quite a few. Um, I think we'll start with um, this we got from the YouTube live feed. Um, Dr. Azwin. Hi, Dr. Azwin. So um, the existence of MQA somewhat supports a captive education system. Would you agree? I think it's a, I mean, a short question there. Yeah, short question and very short answer. Yes, I agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely, I agree. Well, uh, we've got, and yeah, it's sorry. Extremely, extremely bureaucratic. I mean, along with bureaucracy, um, bureaucracy and captive mind go hand in hand together. So yes, definitely. Um, the, the conversation about reforming or transforming our higher education needs to also include MQA, agencies that uh, do the accrediting. And um, for instance, I, it's captive to say that uh, a sociologist planning uh, a syllabus for uh, one semester has to include books only books that are published after 2017. Now, this is ridiculous. Um, what about a historian? Um, there are books published in 1872 that are, are classics and need to be exposed, as students need to be exposed to. Uh, why can't I put um, a published book on 1905? Um, so this captivity is so narrow-minded. Uh, but it's the rules and regulations that come out of MQA, because if you don't follow it in your syllabus, the auditors are going to turn your syllabus down, you're going to lose your accreditation and blah, blah, dee, dah, dee, dah, dee, dah. So, um, so yes, in answer to that question, I do agree. Okay, so there's this question from Mike Chung, um, and, it, and the question goes like this, there's a big difference between public and private higher learning institutions, modus operandi, where one is free of commercial pressures to survive. As such, since private universities have no funding blanket from the government, they are subjected to market preferences. And the market still worships Western rankings, which private universities would dare to ignore such rankings and push ahead with their own merits. Uh, would you then agree that this is a chicken and egg problem? Yeah, I suppose it could be seen as a chicken and egg problem, um, but there is room to negotiate, isn't there? Uh, I, I'm not um, an expert in, in the higher educate, the private higher education system, but let's not take wholesale what is, let me rephrase this. Let us not participate wholesale in the market because after all, what is the market? It is people after all, again, right? And this market dictates what needs to be sold. Who is putting out that product for us to buy? If there is a collective will, it's not that the private system here is helpless and that we have to follow suit. Uh, there are universities who are private um, overseas who also react and challenge this ranking system too. So it's not just a developing world problem. Uh, so I would suggest, uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering the problem or your question accurately, but I would suggest that we do a lot more um, research as to what other countries around the world in the private system are doing to oppose it as well. If we have the desire not to play the same game, then maybe there will be a way out. It may not just be a chicken or egg solution or, or, or um, stalemate. Um, let's see. I mean, we, we also have to look at the system as a hegemonic game between big powers versus small powers. And this exists in the private sector as well. So let's, uh, I would say, don't put the market, this market uh, on such a pedestal that we have no choice, we've got to play, play along. 
But, you know, it, it could seem like it's a naive answer. Uh, but the way I see it is we are always willing to accept this idea that it's market driven, nothing we can do. But who drives the market? Uh, again, it's superpowers, isn't it? It's the big powers who drive the market. Uh, so this also goes into another um, discussion on decolonizing the university um, and a whole array of dis discourse about the idea of decolonizing. And together with that is a discussion on hegemony mm. uh, and academic imperialism. So th this is this is what we need to engage in. Yeah. I suppose it's a it's a it's a tough. I think what uh, Mike is alluding to it's it's a tough battle, especially if you're in the private sector and you depend on uh, private fund. I mean the the fee structures, the you know enrollment, admission. So it's a numbers game at the end of the day. Bottom line dictates uh, you know what 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 is to be pursued, uh, which. I mean, because at the end of the day, now, because we have, and the, and the media has, and the government and leaders, whoever, have hyped this ranking thing so much that everybody looks at it, right? You know, people, uh, people look at what your rankings are. I mean, they're worried that if you do not feature in the rankings, you, you know, you probably lose uh, uh, admissions, you lose enrollment, and that, therefore, um, you know, uh, you're not going to be able to survive um, in the long run. So perhaps um, that it is a, a valid concern, but as you say, perhaps, th I mean, there might be universities out there. There's not enough research done uh, about private universities that are opposing, uh, you know, this ranking system. Um, I have to ask this question because uh, it's written in all caps. Uh, I mean, to me, not maybe the person didn't write it in all caps, but so it's from Simon C. Uh, Simon C says, Hi, Dr. Munira, do you think the academic environment would improve if the AUKU is abolished, AUK, AKU, um, which stands for Akta University than College University? All right. Um, yeah, valid question. And it's a constant question, um, which my answer also might be chicken and egg. <laughs> Um, all right, yes and no. Um, I, you know, I, I am so jaded by the lack of academic culture that, that is there already. Um, talk about academic freedom, okay? Freedom to express yourself. Um, again, how sincere are we when in the public system? Again, my experience uh, having been in the public system do we actually understand what it means to be academically free? Because do we have the capability to do that free research? Are we interested in doing the free research? We're so ingrained in what is easy and simple, plus we are bogged down with the administrative work that we are supposed to do on account of having to publish in Q1 because we are chasing the race the, the game uh, of ranking. Um, what does it mean to abolish AUKU? Are we going to make use of it? But of course, definitely, it is a hindrance. It has been um, a noose around our neck for, de for decades. And we will constantly fight to get rid of it. And I'm hoping that if it is reformed, which, by the way, the previous government um, was uh, heading towards that, but 22 months is not good enough, not, sh not long enough. Um, of course, it's a good start. We, we should abolish it because along with that act is this element of not trusting your staff, not trusting your academic uh, output. Um, treating us like we are incapable of writing correct research or, or are we just actually just blogging to condemn political leaders? I mean, this is ridiculous. So yes, I think abolishing AUKU will definitely help uh, in raising the standard 
but um, it, it has to go along with other things like changing the mode of teaching, how we teach. Um, again, alongside the academic culture of discoursing between your colleagues, your colleagues and you have to engage in discourse, engage in discussions in the corridor, go to visit each other in your rooms. I mean, that doesn't happen. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I don't see that happening. I have not seen it happening for a long time. Yeah. Um, there, there is this attitude of um, envy, maybe. You don't want to share your ideas. You're afraid somebody else will take it. And it's not that we are dealing with um, great minds here who, who can whip up an article in one week or one month um, which is, has earth shattering ideas. No, uh, but this culture has vanished. I remember it existed um, when I was briefly teaching in the US. It, it was very much alive. But then again, that was, you know, in, in the 90s. Um, uh, but here, uh, I, I have not seen it. Yeah, I think, I think we can uh, empathize with the conversation and dialogue between, uh, you know, lectures, because I think a lot of us are so bogged down by work, you know, uh, I, whether it be administrative work, whether it be, you know, chasing, uh, chasing paper, <laughs> or whatever it may be. Uh, the, the, we, when we started off, I, I remember me and, you know, the whole batch, we used to sit up in the, uh, uh, you know, we have this foyer area there in the uh, meeting rooms and, and, and in the staff rooms, and we would sit there and, and there'll be a lot of conversations. A lot of that conversation actually led uh, to a lot of, you know, interesting uh, things. And so, yes, you know, over time, uh, we have less and less. In fact, it doesn't happen now. Uh, if it does happen, it happens uh, um, very rarely because, you know, we just bogged down with work. So, yeah, um, while before I just go on talking about that, let me, let me put this question to you very quickly. You have lamented the loss of academic freedom and individual autonomy in higher education, which is what we just talked about. You have said that no academic attached to a higher education institution anywhere in the world is truly free if that university participates religiously in the ranking exercise. Yeah. So, but isn't the notion of freedom itself an unreal, unrealistic proposition? Whether or, because whether or not we take part in this rankings exercise, because the moment you become an employee of an institution, you become part of a larger collective that is governed by certain rules and policies. So therefore, I mean, I put to you, Dr. Munira, seeking academic freedom is an unrealistic proposition, isn't it? Okay, well, uh, you know, I will take that question to a much higher philosophical level <laughs> um, as a way of avoiding the answer. No, but really, as human beings, are we 100% free anyway? Are we free to spit on your neighbor? Are we free to sh yell? You know, there's no such thing as complete freedom. Unfettered, yeah. Right. Um, and yes, when you join a university, you're part of that um, institution. You conform, there's certain ways of conforming. But you know, we're talking extremes here. Yeah, I, I don't subscribe to extremes. Um, freedom, yes, but we're not talking about unfettered freedom and neither are we talking about putting you under chains. Mm. Uh, what I witness in our culture, in our society, we have a penchant for extremities, or, or sorry, extremes. Um, we either take away <clears throat> our freedom <clears throat> to express ourselves with the act, or else when we discuss, uh, have a discourse or a discussion or conversation about removing it, um, examples are, Complete freedom, everyone will go haywire and, you know. So there is a lack of an intelligent approach to freedom. And the concept of freedom actually is discussed very intelligently in other cultures in the West. You know, we should emulate that from them. Um, 
So in answer to your question, there is no unfettered freedom. But what we need to break free of is the extremes that we have put ourselves in. So is rankings an extreme? Uh, in many ways, yes. Uh, I'm not saying, <clears throat> I, I don't think I've ever said <clears throat> reject the ranking 100%. But there are so many qualifications, so many criteria that each university has to go through, plus <clears throat> exorbitant payment that we have to make uh, to, to take part in the ranking. And for what? Um, we standardize, we use standardized rules and regulations and apply it in our society, in our economic development conditions. Whereas we cannot compare, well, I don't wanna say apples and oranges. We cannot compare bananas and durians to, oh well, Anyway, for, for, for lack of a better, less Eurocentric uh, comparison, yes, we cannot compare apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certain parts of the ranking that yes, we can be amenable to, but not 100%, which is what we are uh, in a frenzy about. So we, we, you know, can I suggest we actually have another discussion about this and not necessarily me, mm. but have a completely dedicated discussion about the world university rankings and how it affects the developing world. Uh, you know, let's expose every one of us to how other countries are dealing with it in the developing world, but also how many developed countries are trying to break free of that as well. Recently, Utrecht in Holland came out uh, with an announcement. Mm. So, I mean, how developed a country is Holland? I mean, they are extremely developed, but they are also realizing the, inhibit, um, the inhibiting rules and regulations of, of the system. Okay. Um, Jinchi, you wanna, you wanna put in a question there from the audience? I think I think Dr. Munira kind of have answered um, most of the questions. The question, yeah, the question from Suresh Kanan, because mm. he asked if global ranking is not a good measure. When she started saying that, and I was like, okay, I think you know it's answered. Um, well, anyway, the question is if global ranking is not a good measure of university standing, then what is a better measure or alternative? I, I think. Yeah, I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just add one last sentence. Um, global ranking is a good exercise, right? It's, it's competition and it creates um, a certain level of quality. But the tendency to standardize and who sets the standards, um, this is what needs to be discussed. There, there needs to be a, a bit more give and take between the global north and the global south. And, and this is my complaint about ranking, you see. Um, the give and take is not there. And it translates or it expands into the way the world is organized today mm. or for a long time since World War II. Um, it's, it's the North versus the South. Um, look at the whole vaccine system now going on. Uh, again, it's hegemony of the powerful over the weak. Um, and I'm looking at ranking that way, you see. Um, th there has to be a, a conversation between the two. But right now, we are accepting everything that is imposed. And the argument is, well, we won't get the funding if we don't. But um, I also don't see enough effort of the governments um, to, to stand up to the West. Mm. I mean, China is doing it, even though they too take part in the ranking and they have their own ranking system. Um, but at, you know, they do stand up to a lot of the hegemonic practices that are coming out of, of um, well, currently it is the US, but, but it has been for a long time of um, 
the European uh, system as well. So th that's that's what I I hope Suresh I've sort of answered your question. So does does chasing rankings by adhering to the benchmark standards of QS and THE annual rankings skew and distort the organic growth and potential of unique growth of educational institutions in 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 in, in you know in uh, developing countries? Well, you know, let's let's look at it this way: the Q of publishing in Q. Um, one journals, for instance. I mean, we we are so uh, we spend a lot of time going through lists of which journal is Scopus and which is Q1, and we need to get published, you know, three times a year in these mag in these uh, journals. Uh, it costs money, right? So we apply for funding so that we can fund these, um, you know, two thousand US dollars to to publish submit an article. But recently, um, in my field, international relations, uh, last year, uh, International Studies Association came out with an open access uh, journal specifically produced, published by Oxford University Press, uh, specifically with the knowledge that it is time to, um, to be inclusive of the poorer countries. Okay, so I've submitted a journal, uh, an article, and it has been accepted. But of course, it doesn't have a Q ranking yet. Hmm. But you see, I don't, I don't do it with that in mind. I do it because the, um, the peer review process was extremely rigorous. Uh, I had to go through two sets of revisions over, over a span of, um, yeah, five or six months. Okay, so it's similar. It's published uh, uh, in by Oxford University Press. It is a product of the International Studies Association. So it's got good DNA. Uh, but the point is, it's not ranked. It's not Scopus yet. I mean, these things take time, right? But I see long term, you know, and my ideas are accepted and it has been rigorously debated during the peer review process. So I look at it that way and I'm not concerned whether it's key one or not, because 10 years down the road, uh, I may make an impact. But how many academics are willing to do that? Mm. You know, we should have that attitude. You know, like everything in life, if you want it, perfect without sacrifice, uh, any sacrifice. It's never gonna happen. Uh, right. Call me naive or, or, you know, maybe I am, but uh, there has to be an element of sacrifice here. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna read out a couple of quotes and it will lead to, the, to a very sim simple question. Um, the quotes are from your, from your various numerous articles uh, that you've written. Oh, so they, they're quite long. So I'm going, to go, I'm going to go through them real quick. Yeah. <laughs> so we have, uh, this is one quote that goes, um, the traditional university became a factory of information packaging. What used to be a space for discursive engagement or a search for knowledge has now become an impassioned assembly line of market, marketable products. These products are human academics, and graduates we produce, but they might be as well, they might as well be soulless containers, piles of styrofoam receptacles. Another quote, the, the crisis that our universities face today is an intellectual one within the moral context. We are facing the degradation of our, our institutions and debasement of learning. Strong words, another quote, Universities are consumed by unrestrained market dominance. The old paradigm in scholarship was the search for connection between politics, culture, economics, the arts, history, and society. This has faded. The consequences is that the public sphere has become a space of anti-intellectualism. I could go on and on and on with your with you know with these. Quotes, but I'm going to stop here. My question is, 
aren't you afraid aren't you afraid that you know in writing such um strongly worded um views could eventually hurt you in your um academic and professional life um you know i don't want to get personal um i'd rather not engage in in how it affects me because i i'm a pretty private person but i understand the direction of your question meaning you'd like me to advise the younger generation as to um whether they should be open and criticize now look i i must admit i enjoy writing i'm good at it and i'm able to express myself very clearly on paper um but whether it hurts me or not um i think i'm saying the right thing i'm not criticizing individuals i'm not holding specific political parties to blame i'm looking at the bigger picture um you know these are problems that everyone knows i'm not saying anything new actually i'm just putting them down on paper and in english this time um they are not surprising um observations mm. everyone thinks the same thing they just don't express it um leadership knows about it we talk about sustainable education or don't we but what is the meaning of sustainable sustainable means you need to know make the connection between history and sociology as well as engineering it doesn't mean you manufacture only an, an engineer and expect that engineer to be marketable because eventually does that person that engineer have the uh education and all rounded education which includes inter civilizational history <clears throat> excuse me history no we are very myopic we are very narrow minded in our educational experience and that's what i mean by factory we get the material from primary and secondary school they enter the university they remain narrow there's no discourse we are only teaching specific and now very sexy topics you know you have i mean i don't even understand some of the titles of these courses because you're trying your best to keep up with the changing market driven forces uh in order to be employable but let's look at what has developed we still have unemployed graduates despite these sexy courses so i mean are we questioning why i mean you have to question why right so am i um i i don't know if i'm answering and i think i won't answer <laughs> <laughs> you are exercising your academic freedom and we are supportive of that <laughs> anyway look i'm retiring in 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 less than 2 years and um many probably think i'm over the hill so you know let it be i i've had an a, a fruitful academic career i have no complaints but i i have criticisms that's what i have Uh, um i don't think you're over the hill in fact i think you're on your way up the hill and uh, i think a lot of us would agree um a lot of what you write resonates um there that there, there are tough questions tough criticisms and i think a lot of it is valid um and uh, i hope um you know uh in time at least before i die at least Uh, you know <laughs> things change for the better and i get to see it um you know maybe even experience it if i'm lucky but um with, with that i think uh, i would like to thank you for your time uh, and i'd like to uh i hope maybe when your tenure is up maybe we'll see you on this side of the of the wall yeah that would be great um with that <laughs> i'm going to hand it over to jinji thank you vinod 
yeah, we were having our, while you were sharing your answer, we were like talking to each other, like, can we keep her? She's intelligent. We love her. <laughs> Stay with us. So, yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Munira. Let's keep in touch. Uh, you know, I, I must, um, I, I don't think I've told you, um, uh, my son went to uh, Taylor's and uh, he graduated, um, he was in the American program. So he's in the US now, but uh, he enjoyed it. And uh, I enjoyed your campus as well. I've been a, a couple of times. Well, they, if there's one thing we do well, I mean, or rather we, we try hard to do well is to try to uh, try to make the experience enjoyable. It's not always successful when I try to do it, but you know, I try still. <laughs> um, It'd okay be great then. To host you. Yeah. yeah, I think we will take you up on that suggestion where we should have a larger panel to talk about these the rankings thing um, it, with you know more people involved so that uh, the 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 discussion is a lot more um, uh, richer uh, and we have different views um, and, and that's probably something maybe we should we should do a special edition Jinchi uh, you know something to think about. Yes. Yes. Definitely. Right. That'll be great. Okay. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight as well. So we will now exit and um, Dr. Munira, join us also for the next um, session, which will be in two weeks time. We will send you the invitation. Um, yeah, with that, um, I would thank my team here as well. I'd like to thank them. Charles yes. Vikram. Thank you. Yeah. And thank, know, you, thank you to the participants too for your questions. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Munira. You take care. Good night. Uh, be, Good night. Before, 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 before we go, before we go, uh, let's take a, a nice screenshot. I'm just going to take another screenshot here. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> okay. Ready? One, two, three. Smile. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Munira. It's All been right. done. Good night. Bye. Good night, Bye. Dr. Munira. Bye. Good night. Bye. It was so nice to see you, meet her. Oh, and her. are we offline? Not yet. Oops. Not yet. And to those in YouTube, good night. Bye-bye. Thanks for staying with us. Thanks for watching. Bye. Hey, Stay the... safe. What the, what does that mean? The fourth uh, Live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. <laughs>